So thank you so much, uh, guys, for, first of all, making this film, contributing to this film, a really, really important uh, document of someone who's critically important to British culture, I think. So uh, maybe, Ian, I'll start with you, because you kind of came up with this idea for this film, for doing this. Tell us a little bit what, what was the genesis of it and why, why McQueen and why now? Um, the general idea of the structure of the film was was thought together with Peter, but um, for me, the genesis, yeah, the importance of, I mean, I came to, to the UK in 97, and as a young creative, when you came to, you know, London was the place to be, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not the only one with a funny accent in this country mm -hmm. 20 years down the line mm -hmm. that actually came in that amazing, you know, cool Britannia time. Um, Lee was everywhere, you know, you, you, if, whatever you studied or whatever you liked, you, music, fashion, film, you know, Lee directed music videos, Lee was in, you know, on the front page of many magazines, he, he collaborated with amazing visual artists, Nick Knight, uh, David LaChapelle, you know, you name it, he was working with them, uh, creating art, etc., etc. So, for, for me, when someone mentioned that um, I'd be perfect to, to do the, the documentary, first of all, I was thinking, no, I'm not the one perfect to make it, but you give me the chance, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. and like Sebastian Ponce, there's nothing to think about, I'll do it. Um, but I'll yeah, take the I job. Mean, yeah, I'll take the job. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's basically that's basically it. But the the main concept and storyline and structure and the film in general, we kind of devise it with uh, together with Peter. Mm. And Peter, you came on. So Ian, you came you came onto the project first, and then Peter, you joined in. So tell us a little bit how you. Well, I kind of stalked Ian <laughs> as soon as I found out that that there was there was a rumor going around that he was going to um, uh, make a McQueen documentary. And um, I basically stalked him and, uh, and said, look, whatever happens, I'll, I'll even make the tea for you, but I have to work on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and Because why? What, what, well, why is it so compelling for you? A few reasons, really. Um, uh, I mean, from my own personal point of view, I just made a film about Marlon Brando and written a film about Marlon Brando, which was a documentary. And it was the first time I really worked in an edit on a documentary in a way that was just, it was just so exciting. And, you know, Brando's obviously an amazing, amazing um, character, 20th century life. Um, and, uh, and the whole process of making documentary, the way that you sort of like, you know, kind of almost, it's a form of collage, but within storytelling as well, you're bringing together so many different media to tell a story through. Very exciting. So I was kind of thinking, well, who, who can you do? Who who could follow Marlon Brando basically, um, and uh, and so McQueen obviously. Yeah. From my point of view, I mean, uh, yes, I was very aware of everything that was going on with Cool Britannia, but um, my father was in the rag trade. Um, he was Joseph Atedgi of the Joseph Stores, and um, my dad always loved. One of his passions was discovering new talent. Uh, and he started with Kenzo, and he went through, you know, Catherine Hamler, many, many, many designers, the Japanese designers, Comde Garçon, Yoji Yamamoto. He brought them all to, to England. And um, in the early 90s, um, Galliano and then McQueen emerged. And for my father, that was a, a new golden age. And Izzy Blow actually dragged uh, my dad to one of the very earliest McQueen shows. And as soon as um, McQueen started, producing, um, Dad bought his collections for, for Joseph. Um, so I kind of knew a little bit, even though I wasn't, I shouldn't say this, I wasn't really that interested in the fashion world. Um, I, I kind of, I was very intrigued by this sort of, all, all of these sort of headlines um, about bumpsters and all of this on one hand and, and, and this kind of badass image that he had. And on the other hand, my dad, I remember my dad telling me, you know, but, but he's not, you know, underneath all the controversy, he is, he's an artist, he's someone who knows how to cut cloth like no one else. Uh, and he does every part of the whole process himself, you know, not like a designer who draws and hands it over to the atelier. Um, so this was kind of like quite an intriguing juxtaposition, really, in contrast. And, uh, I, I, and then, yeah, so that was, that was I, I was kind of compelled by him as a personality from very early on and just felt, wow, the opportunity to make a, a documentary would be would be incredible, and um, yeah, we hadn't worked together, but we we really sort of um, really kind of found a good rhythm together. And and Gary, I mean, what you really get strongly from the film is that the way that uh, Alexander worked was absolutely like a 
family community that was built around him, whether it be actual family like yourself or yeah. the people he worked with. So when you were growing up, mm. seeing this, talking about this 90s moment, it's called Britannia. Were you aware of that watching kind of as, as Lee grew up and being around that? Were you aware that something really exciting was happening and that your uncle was at the centre of it? Uh, well, I remember uh, growing up with him in Stratford and I always knew it was quite different anyway. Um, he used to wear these sort of yellow and black um, sort of uh, camo trousers and he used to have uh, sort of kids chasing him and taking the mickey out of him, really, you know. He was really like a punk <laughs> of the era. But I always knew there was something uh, quite special about him. You know, he was um, really quite eccentric from a young age. Mm. And, uh, you know, the babysitting that he used to do for us was always quite exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, lots, of, lots of horror films. Like yeah, movies. lots of horror films cool. and horror pictures and horror stories. And How old were you? About six. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was a little less Mary Poppins, a little bit more <laughs> Child Catcher from Chitty Bang Bang, mm -hmm. which he used to quote word for word. So. Yeah. And when did you... Um, so you obviously worked really closely with him in the last kind of... You are saying seven years, I think, you were yeah. working really close with him. So how did you... How did you then get kind of caught up and, and captured within this world? Um, well, I was always quite artistic, really. Um, and I never knew there was really anything more to fashion than clothes. Mm. But um, I ended up being out of work um, at the time I was about 25. And Lee had a position that opened at menswear uh, for a textile designer. So um, he gave me the opportunity to uh, come into that world. Um, and I learned to take my artistic skills mm -hmm. and then apply that to a 3D canvas, really. So mm. um, it was a little bit different in terms of how I'd work. Yeah. Um, it was learning to adapt that sort of pattern pieces and engineering, which Alexander McQueen are quite well known for. Yeah. And I think the thing that comes across in the film is that this is... He is more than someone who's just making clothes. I mean, even yeah. the fact that he created his story story world, the way that he made stories around um, his designs was really... It transformed music, it transformed the theatre, it transformed uh, music videos, it transformed all of these, all of these it things. It transcended it all. Yeah. Really, yeah. So um, there was this kind of interbreeding of um, the theatrics and that storytelling and... Um, performance art within his work so it really pushed fashion into something else really mm. what's what's amazing about this film when I was reading the press notes is that you started shooting April 2017 which is just is that right which That's is just right. That's less right. it was just over a year ago which is kind of insane we were actually told that we had to deliver the film sorry in July <laughs> in July 2017 in July 2017. don't tell them <laughs> We so missed that deadline. Massively overran, guys. It took way too long on this film. Quite yes, long. and we, we were starting, literally, I think, we, uh, yeah, we shot the first interview and we were already in the edit. So, yes, because the timing was so short. This, I don't want to bore people here, but there's so many ways to make film. And, and at the time, um, there was a, a biopic, you know, about uh, Alexander oh. McQueen. So let's say that in the zeitgeist of filmmaking, yeah. There was a project about Lee, and, um, and when we came to it, and when Peter wrote and uh, the, the sort of structure of the film that we wanted to follow, and I, and I you know, kind of directed a visual identity that we would try to have, um, and we took it to the, to the market in Berlin in 2017, we could really feel that people wanted it. You know, I, I, I sat with a lot of people. Uh, I had a lot of meetings with distributors, and it could really, there was a sense like, People, I think, really liked our approach, and they really wanted, but they really wanted the film about Lee. I think they were, that, that, that's what struck me. So basically, we went in into editing and shooting at the same time, as the same time as archiving. I mean, we, you know, it was quite of a rock and roll 12 months. Right. Yeah. And they, they, importantly, I mean, they wanted, they wanted the approach, and they wanted us, and, but they wanted it to be before any of these other myriad projects that were out there. So that was why there was a little bit of pressure on us. I mean, it's quite interesting because I was just saying to my colleague earlier that it, it, given the fact that he's such a, uh, in many ways, a romantic figure, you know, there are, he, he's, he's the epitome of this grand artist 
um, Renaissance man, which you don't really get so much anymore, that there haven't been loads and loads and loads of films by Alexander McQueen. So it's quite surprising that this is the first to have come out. I mean, there's been, there's, there hasn't been, um, and that's one thing as well, when, when we talked to, to the distributor, we wanted to do, we, we felt that Lee's talent, Lee's story, Lee's life, Lee's, everything about Lee needed a, the big canvas. And I think they were, there had been documentaries, mm -hmm. uh, but they were more TV documentaries. There was, okay. The latest one was an arty documentary, which was very nice, 52 minutes, but um, he didn't, we felt that he had missed out on, on the on the grandioseness of everything, mm -hmm. I think if you know, he, as, as Gary was just saying, and you, he was such a, a fantastic storyteller, mm -hmm. and we, we felt that you know you had to really you, you had to tell a story about mm -hmm. him, um, yeah. and I don't think that had been done really before in a way that certainly we found compelling. So there yeah. was definitely a void to be filled, and you know, a lot of people that liked the film, it was the Savage Beauty and the Met Show, so that few years post Lee's passing, I think the interest in Lee, and I think, I think actually blow people's mind that, you know, even at the Met, they put on the show and then suddenly they sold the most tickets they've ever sold to a show. Then they bring it to the v and and they sell the most tickets for a show. And then suddenly the entire fashion industry realized and finally accepted themselves as a proper art form. I think even themselves were doubting it. Yeah. And I really do believe that the, the fashion industry post Savage Beauty, uh, you know, the, that whole thing. And then that means that... I think that was quite a personal approach as well with uh, the v in particular, where, where it felt like Lee was sort of um, narrating the whole thing as well, which is what you guys do very well with this film as well. You really, uh, well I do when I watch it, I really feel that closeness to Lee, you know, and people have come up to me who didn't know much about Lee or fashion in general, but felt like they connected with him mm. in this film and they feel that loss even more so as well mm. at the end. Mm. Yeah. How did you feel when you were approached to be part of it? As obviously it's, it's uh, he's your family, you know, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, we was always quite dubious of people, uh, but I trusted a Frenchman who, <laughs> <laughs> who uh, called me up. I, I met him down a pub anyway, <laughs> and, I'd, uh, you know, I was quite intrigued. And he never goes to the pub normally, Yeah, by yeah, way. I took him to the roughest one. <laughs> and, um, and he, didn't, yeah, he, he was, was in his, nice wine he wine was in his sex and he didn't run away, so he might be <laughs> all right. <laughs> but um, after spending a couple of hours with, with Ian, um, I had total confidence that what he was going to do uh, with Lee's story was something on a very um, uh, sensitive level and creative level as well, mm. which I thought would mm. really pay tribute to Lee mm. in the best way. Mm. I think the one thing that I say that I love about the two gentlemen to my left is there's a very strong sense of family. Definitely. We all, uh, I'd say family men, and we all share very very strong love of our families, which are all here supporting us today. Thank you very much, guys. And, 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 and I think for, for me, the v &A and those shows are very much about the art. And I always believe that the art is nothing without the people behind. Yeah. You have to understand the people to see the art. And in all our, all our path in our creative world, always come where we're from. And we, you know, we venture off and we learn, we move countries, etc., etc. But there's always something inherent to, to family, to upbringing, to what we have. Yeah, I don't know, Lee was like a special case really, because he, he's not really the sort of person that you associate with, like you say, that opulence of fashion and all that. It's, it's almost uh, an otherworldly kind of gift that is given and born into a very normal kind of body. Yeah. So, um, I did smile all the way through the film that as the clothes got more and more grandiose, his, his clothes got more and more. Yeah. yeah. He was a very practical like person. Polo That's shirt and jeans. I don't know if there's, is there anybody from McQueen here tonight that I invited? Oh, Patrick. Hello. These, these are all people that uh, worked with Lee for many years, uh, longer than I did, actually. <laughs> Go back for me. <laughs> uh, Lee was very uh, practical in the way, because he didn't make it about himself, he made it about mm. his visions and about the women that he was dressing. Mm. Um, yeah, it was just about mm. his stories, wasn't it, really? Mm. So he dressed very practically. Mm. And you got a lot of him in the film, which is, which is great for us in terms of he, you get him narrating his own story. Wasn't there an archive 
towards the end of the film, as towards the end of you making the film that you discovered in terms of lots of footage of yeah. him? Is that true? Did I, I get mean, that right? it's quite or? interesting, the archive story, because, you know, every other document, I've done, only done a like, every other document, I've only done a couple. <laughs> <laughs> but there's been this You're already like, a veteran. There's been this huge sort of, like, archive that we started with. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, 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 we've been given a library, or we've been said that you've got access to everything, and, you know, uh, and on this, we had our passion to make this film a few pages of um, of script and photos and things that we'd put together, and tumbleweed, mm -hmm. nothing. And so we really had to sort of, I mean, obviously we went on YouTube, as you do, mm -hmm. um, and we found certain things we thought, oh, that might be interesting, but then everyone's seen everything on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to go out and you have to get what Ian always calls the little nuggets. Um, <laughs> and and that, was, that, that, that was a process that continued you know, f from the point where we started working on it in, that, in March 17, right the way through to the end of the process. Mm. And we were kind of like chasing up leads all the time through that. And we had some very special interview footage that came in at the end. Um, and we had people who, you know, who would actually give us cassettes of audio, of conversations that, that, um, that, 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 that he, they'd recorded with Lee. Can, I, can I jump in this one, how those cassettes come? Someone, yeah, someone yeah. which had been really close to Lee and interviewing uh, Lee a lot, actually now we can say Tim, Tim Blanks, um, said, oh, I've got those tapes, I've recorded Lee millions of times, you know, we were very close, and we knew all of that. And, and I remember we went to an event uh, at Saraband, and very casually, Tim says, hey, hello, Ian, I have the cassette. And I remember he gave me those cassettes, and literally I, didn't, I put them next to my bed, and I didn't sleep because we the had originals. Yeah, the like, originals. Yeah, yeah. And he's just handing them to me. Hi, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no box. Yeah. And I remember 180 minutes, the two 90 minute things. So we kind of like, you know, because just, well, we, we can backtrack to that. But I mean, when we made the Brando film, it was really narrated by Brando. And that was just fantastic. And we kind of thought we'd never be able to do that with, with this film. Um, and when we had those cassettes and we had them transcribed, um, what well, digitized and then transcribed and listened to them. And it, you know, we suddenly realized we had a way of, even though we couldn't use Brando's voice, uh, McQueen's voice quite as much as, as we did Brando's in, in the Brando film, we realized that we could push Lee right to the, the front of the film, mm -hmm. make him the spider at the center of the web, as, mm -hmm. as Simon Costin calls him, um, and, uh, and have the other contributors sort of almost like supporting that or almost being in conversation with him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and so that was, um, that was a, a great point. And I think that was the point where we realized, actually, we, we, can, we, we, can, we can make a feature-length film. And, and there's so many themes in, in Lee's life that can be contentious and salacious, et cetera, et cetera. We never wanted to leave the responsibility for my, for only for my contributors to come up with some truth because you can always distort people's word. And the way to build up you know, the trust with people was like, even in the interviews, we never, I, tell me, but we never pushed or anything. We just, I yeah, think we were... Done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, you let us obviously, yeah. Speak. No, and. and <laughs> <laughs> you still got the guns to your back the, the, right the, now. The two of us there. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but the, interrogated. My, 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 my point is that, the, you know, you. I feel very responsible for the 25 people which have taken part in the film very much. And no, you've been very. All the way through. Um, Peter and Ian have been very sympathetic in the way that they've approached this and um, understanding all the way they've been supportive and they continue to be uh, mm. to the end, so yeah, we appreciate that. The, the problem is that we, we, we knew that we wanted Michael Nyman to... Do you love we, Michael Nyman? Yeah, because yeah. Lee loved Michael Nyman, so, you know, um, and we didn't actually get him properly on board until September, by which time... A long term of negotiation. Yeah. Uh, and, and convincing him that we, <laughs> that we could do it. <laughs> we were trying to convince ourselves at the same time, which probably didn't help. Um, and so, you know, but at that point, we only had two or three months left until we had to deliver the locked picture cut. That's not enough time to compose an original score. Um, and Michael was sort of like also touring, the, he tours the world constantly with his band. And um, so there, it was just immediately obvious that we wouldn't be able to use 
uh, to use, have original music composed for the film. So at that point, what we agreed is that we'd sort of, because Lee referred to specific uh, soundtracks that, that, that Nyman had composed, like the piano, which he, he adored, didn't he, Gary? Um, we, we just kind of like thought, okay, well, let's work with Michael's pre-existing music. Um, but, and Michael then delivered us a 30 hours of music. Well, Lee would be obsessed with music as, um, during the seasons as well, so he'd play something on repeat constantly driving everybody else crazy, but that's, that's what he did, and everybody who works with Lee would live through that as well, and pick up on, you know, become part of it, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so, and, and so basically what we did is, when we, we took that mu music, we sort of found themes and motifs for different characters, and it wasn't all the film music that everyone knows, Draftsman's Contract, the Greenaway films, the piano. It was also his symphonies, his chamber music, scores that no one had ever heard before, strange experimental things with gamelan bands and electronica and so on. The diversity was just fantastic, and we suddenly thought, well, we can find so many different moods um, uh, of the film. And, and what was great was it liberated us. We didn't have to wait for a score to come in. We could work directly with the music and actually kind of create scenes and montages um, with the music as a, as a, you know, as a sort of vital element. What we did tend to do is we sort of started, it was more orchestrals, more the band, and as the film goes on, we strip instruments away. It's sort of like, you know, the last few cues really are, are, are very much piano solos. So we wanted the music to kind of reflect that, the movement of the emotional story. There's another really nice little nugget that happened is when we first met Michael, he said, oh, he, he opened his, his laptop and he said, oh, I've got something to play you. And he played us a track which was called Saraband, which is actually composed for Lee, but Lee at the last second decided to use an, uh, the Schindler's List soundtrack. And this, was a, this was for the, sorry, sorry, yeah. just to set it up, this was for the hologram of Kate okay. Moss. Yeah. So basically we love that track and we actually put it and it's, it's, we put it back where it belonged against the hologram of, of, of Kate Moss, and we used it as, at the end. But that felt amazing to have actually something composed for Lee that n nobody had heard, and we could actually use that. I think you know, one other thing that I would love to talk about is, is the skull, mm -hmm. which is the process of the skull, which, yeah, you know... Which is a lot. <laughs> it, yeah, which it could be a film within itself, really. Yeah. Um, so the idea behind this uh, came from... Uh, uh, the still life Vanitas movement from 17th century uh, in which you've got paintings that depict um, life and death. So the skull itself was uh, actually digitally sculpted. This is actually a sculpture that's been photographed. <laughs> so I digitally sculpted uh, the framework, which is all the gold framework that you see. Um, this was then 3D printed uh, and gold foiled and then filled with real flowers. Um, you'll see a couple of scenes within the film where the flowers are dying, which is actually a actual time-lapse of real flowers dying, and the bird is actually in the skull flying out. So um, this, this is, uh, I have to mention, Dan Tobin Smith actually captured the final image of this. <laughs> but um, yeah, this was a real uh, kind of experimental process, pushing those boundaries of uh, digital art, photography, uh, flower art. <laughs> Um, patience yeah, of patience. everyone involved yeah. because you well, have to think that we making a right. documentary and then suddenly you go off and telling everybody yeah. that you're going to use some stuff in the film and they're going to get a great poster but, but they can't see it <laughs> but there's a budget yeah. but you're not going to see it before it's sculpted and blah 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 so it was a uh, real rock and rolls as well oh. that one I think we got the final image actually right, yeah. a week before we actually delivered the film. Yeah, it's yeah. worth saying that this is kind of almost the, also the, the kind of the third iteration of this Vanitas image that you've you've done yeah. of Lee and the skull, isn't it? The first one was the invitation. Oh yeah, I did one which was the Savage Beauty, uh, gold chrome, whatever you want to call it, skull, which melts with Lee's face. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to sell anything, it's just coincidence. <laughs> no, but the idea was because <laughs> Gary had done it for the show um, <clears throat> and then for Savage Beauty, we thought it'd be amazing to have the story that Lee's film was represented as well by Gary's artwork. That was one of the, the concepts behind as well. Yeah, this one's got 10 frames in it. and um, the, the picture of Lee was actually taken in his, in his office. Um, by you. 
by me, and he's not the most patient person to take a picture of. Mm. And I was still learning photography at the time, so I was like, get the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I was oh, couldn't get to work. Anyway, got it done. And uh, the skull was then created from uh, images of Tower Bridge, which um, were manipulated into the skull itself. So. It's yeah. really beautiful. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> a, a few interviews. We 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 de, we we always. If you make a movie doc, you really need to build the characters and you need to let them go. And you don't want to duplic duplicate those characters if you want the flow of the story to work. So some people, so somehow we realized that there was not even a repeat in what they're saying, but there was a sort of repeat of what they would represent within Lee's life. Um, we didn't leave too many... We never set out to tell fantastical or incredible truth. So we didn't like... There's no dark secret we left behind, etc. that we were discovering because we, we always always said the work, you know, it's we like Lee says it, you know, it's everything was autobiographical uh, autobiographical. If you want to know me, look at my work. But I, I mean I would say that there was a lot of there were a lot of wonderful anecdotes that just didn't fit in the film. I, you know, I mean, Sebastian Pons told us story after story of what, it, of things that Lee did in the studio. That Lee and Sebastian were both obsessed with Balenciaga, and in particular, one jacket that was made with just one seam in it. And they spent an evening talking and drinking um, about Balenciaga and about this particular jacket. Sebastian went home to bed eventually, and when he came into the studio the next morning, McQueen had worked all night long on a mannequin and he'd reproduced the Balenciaga jacket with one seam. And there were you know, countless stories of this. Yeah, Murray said the same. He, could, he didn't know where Lee was spending the night. And, but m the, the thing where we always wanted, we, we had a, a rule, which was uh, emotion over information. So if something became too much geeky or too many details, but kind of took it away from that journey and that energy you, you described that we really wanted to. We, you know, the, we could maybe do DVD extras, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, li Lionsgate, Lorna, um, <laughs> DVD extras, yes, definitely. Those. <laughs> Another two or three films worth of stuff there. <laughs> but as Peter said, you know, we, we, we did four hours. I mean, I think with you we spent, I think with Gary we spent four hours. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, we... Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, there was a lot said, wasn't there? But yeah, yeah it was just cut down to obviously fit within the flow of the film. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and Gary told some wonderful stories as well about, you know, Lee working in the studio and changing things at the last minute and working under this tremendous pressure where... Let's get the team up here. <laughs> they know all about that, mate. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mira as well had a great story, which I love, which uh, she, she, they had made um, a coat out of horse hair and she spent three days hacking into it to get the special shape and nobody thought she could do it. N neither herself, but Lee wanted a special shape. He wanted a silhouette. He always wanted a silhouette, you know, that, that, that really worked. It would really push it to the extreme uh, to start with, really. Um, because, you know, obviously, you want to start to that extreme and then you can always refine it down. So, um, to get the best out of that silhouette, obviously. Mm. So, um, unfortunately, we have to end there, but Gary, I just want to ask you so, obviously, the House of McQueen is still going. And tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. What's what are you focusing um, on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've started my own brand at the moment, which is based on um, a similar storytelling aspect that I've inherited, but it's um, at the moment it's primarily scarves. Mm. Um, uh, I see myself really as an image maker, a storyteller, and it's the scarves at the moment which I'm projecting this onto. Um, so it's just really putting ideas out there that I've got in my mind and what I feel at the time, you know. Yeah. Um, so I'm aiming to do maybe kimonos in the future. Oh, yeah. Sign me up for one of those. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, the yeah. scarves are exquisite. Yeah. We're trying to get Gary to sort of maybe perhaps make a scarf with... Um, yeah, we're still in talks about that, but there's, there's a possibility of this being on a scarf as well. So yeah. just trying to sort out the legal stuff on that, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, what, what I think is really great to end there is because I think what really came across in the film is that how Lee was so committed to passing on his skills, nurturing new talent, bringing them on and passing on that story to yeah. a whole another generation. What Lee would do is he would present people with opportunities and then it was up to them to do something with it. Yeah. 
you know, but he, he would give people opportunities. Yeah, yeah, it's a great legacy. Thank you all for Thank making fun of the comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.